Hello, my name is Dr. Samantha Curl, and I'm an assistant professor in applied linguistics. I teach on the TESOL program, and I'm also the director of the Master in Research in Advanced Quantitative Research Methods. Uh, the following video is a taster lecture where I'll introduce research methods to you. This topic is important um, to develop your understanding of research methods, as you'll need to conduct a small scale study as part of your TESOL degree. But it's such a huge topic. I just want to introduce some basics to you so that you have a, a very general idea. All right, let's get going. So, first of all, what does quantitative mean? This is possibly the first time you've heard this word, quantitative. So it's relating to measuring or measured by the quantity of something rather than its quality. So qualitative. So now we're looking at the quantity of something, and that usually involves numbers and statistics, and you're counting something. Um, this type of data can be graphed and can be put into tables and charts. Now, qualitative data, you can do the same, but this is particularly um, relevant to quantitative data. So why use quantitative methods in educational research? When we want information that can be quantified in some way, then we use quantitative data collection methods. When we analyze that data, we can present it in two different ways, in a descriptive way or in an explanatory or exploratory way. So descriptive quantitative research is to portray an accurate profile of data about persons, events or situations. So this is simply describing your data. So if you collect some data, for example, you want to look at the learning outcomes in science classrooms uh, and what the students are achieving in those classrooms. So you could describe the distribution of the scores. So what is the highest score? What is the lowest score? Um, what is the middle score? And you could simply just describe that data. Now, if you're looking at explanatory quantitative research, or you're doing explanatory data collection, this seeks to explain a situation or a problem, to explain patterns relating to the phenomenon, to identify relationships between aspects. So this is different to just describing your data. You're actually now going to identify relationships between different aspects of your data. So for example, if you want to look at the, the difference in learning outcomes in science classrooms according to gender, you could look at this and run a statistical test to see whether there's a relationship there. So this is actually explanatory and explaining the relationships between these aspects rather than simply describing, you know, how, what is the ratio of gender in the classroom. That could be something you describe um, or you describe the learning outcomes. Um, that would simply be descriptive. But now you want to look at the relationship between those, you would run some kind of statistical test. Right, variables. So we're just introducing some new words today. So quantitative data can be described in terms of variables. A variable is a property by which members of a group differ from each other. When we looked at the science classroom as a whole, when we look at the members in that classroom, we're looking at the different um, genders. So that would be a variable. The variable would be gender because According to a person's gender, that differs, that, that makes them different from other members in that classroom. So variables are usually differentiated into four main categories. The independent variable, IV, or a predictive variable. A dependent variable, DV, or outcome variable. A controlled variable, a control variable, something that's kept constant. Or a confounding or extraneous variable, one that might affect the independent on the dependent variable. So for example, if you're doing a study on memory recall and you want to look at how well people recall things from memory, well, looking at the age of your participants will be quite important because as you get older, some people may suffer from dementia and have memory issues. So that could be something, a confounding variable in your study, and that's important to take into consideration. So the different types of variables, an independent variable answers the question, what is independent and does not change? So if we operationalize gender as the variable that does not change in our study, at that moment, this is how those students identified as their gender. A dependent variable answers the question, what is dependent on the independent variable? So what changes according to the independent variable? So What's changing in our study when we're looking at the science learning outcomes um, is the science score on the test. That's changing depending on 
the gender depending on the student, right? So that's our dependent variable. Control variables um, answer the question, what do I keep the same? So what do I keep the same and don't change? For example, the teacher. So we're only looking at one class that's taught by the same teacher and the, the teacher is constant so that the teacher doesn't change. So the learning outcome can't be affected by a teacher. There can't be a teacher effect because it's the same teacher. We could argue, oh, well, you were taught differently by this teacher and therefore your learning outcome is different. But in this case, we've controlled for that and said, okay, we're only having this teacher teach um, that class and we're looking at the learning outcomes from that class. So that stays the same. There's no teacher effect. Extraneous variables answer the question, what other variables, not the focus of the study, might mediate the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable? In this case, you may argue and say, well, what about socioeconomic status? So in the research, it shows that students who are from a more affluent background will have more resources, they'll have more exposure to books, um, their parents may have very professional jobs and so expose their children to more scientific concepts in our science example. So you could say, well, in this study, we're going to look at the difference in learning outcomes according to gender, but we're going to control for or we're going to take into consideration the extraneous variable of socioeconomic status. So that we're not focusing on socioeconomic status in our study but we're taking that into account because that may affect the learning outcomes in the science classroom. So some examples of variables. So this is what a data set looks like. If you've never seen a data set, this is what it will look like. This is a variable, this is a variable, this is a variable, and this is a variable. Do you see how this works? So the person is basically an identifier. You've given each of your participants a number. This is not necessary, but in, in this data set, um, the researchers decided that they'd like to number all their participants. So that's the person variable. The gender variable, here we have 010101. So in this study, gender has been operationalized as male or female, so binary. Here we've got education level. So we've got undergraduate for one, master's for two, and PhD for three. And so we've got the different education level of our participants. Did they study up until university? Did they get a master's degree or a PhD? You could include a zero if they did not go to university. That all depends on your, your sample, on your participants. And then we've got age here. We've got an actual number for their age. The data is coded. You can see how female has changed to zero and male has changed to one in your data set. We don't see any words here. We see numbers because this is quantitative data, right? Again, undergraduate, master's, PhD have been transformed into numbers into, in our data set. It's important to remember that variables are created or adjusted by the researcher. So in this data set, the researcher operationalized gender as a binary concept, male, female. So that's something that you'll need to justify and explain in your research project. Um, why did you um, operationalize gender as binary, male or female? Or why didn't you, in case you want to include other options, 0, 1, 2, 3, um, depending on how you want to measure gender. Again, you're going to need to justify why you did this. And the justification isn't for you to need to defend your research. It's simply to explain to the reader what you did and why. And it's always good to be very explicit about these things. So in this study, for example, we haven't included people who didn't go to university and there may be a good reason for that. But it's important to justify the reasons for that. And these are the types of things that you can see already that these variables are dictated by the researcher. The researcher has decided gender is binary and therefore I'm measuring it that way. And so they've got two numbers only or two choices. If you measure it in a different way, you give them more options and you'll have more numbers because now that's a different option. So do you see how this works? We are transforming words into numbers, and those numbers are what gets put into our data set. So let's move on to levels of measurement. So we've got two main different types of levels of measurement, or two different levels of measurement. And after just saying that quantitative data is numbers, well, you saw that some of them are words. 
And so we break these down into categorical and continuous. Those are the two overarching types of data you can collect. So let's go into them one by one. So categorical variables are qualitative or discrete. So we've got nominal, dichotomous, and ordinal. Now, nominal have two or more categories. So, for example, the different types of universities, there's no order here. So Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard. So they're two or more categories, but they're not ordered. They don't need to be in any specific order. Or your first language, your second language, or your third language. That's a nominal variable. So a dichotomous variable only has two categories, dichotomous, so two. For example, do you own a car? Yes or no. Are you going to operationalize gender as binary, male or female? Or, for example, subject. So we're looking at maths and science learning outcomes, so one and two. So there's, there's, there are two categories there. Again, this doesn't have any order to it, maths or science. There's no order there. Ordinal variables um, have two or more categories that can be ordered or ranked, um, but there's no value or number to the ranking. So, for example, Likert scale data um, is actually ordinal data, agree, neutral, disagree. We cannot say agree is twice as positive as disagree. All the types of students, undergraduate, master's, doctoral, so these need to go in that order. You need to finish your undergrad to move on to a master's, you need to finish your master's to move on to your doctorate. Now let's move on to continuous data. These are quantitative, so they're numbers in and of themselves. So we looked at age, so this is already a number there. We didn't have to change to the number, this was already a number, right? So continuous variables can be ranked or not. We've got interval or ratio, but we don't really make this differentiation. Uh, most of the time we're dealing with interval data, and it can be measured along a continuum. It has a numerical value. So, for example, age, either you can give them a bracket, so 20 to 30 years old, or I'm 30 to 40 years old, or they can actually write their actual number of age. But basically, 20 between 20 and 30 is the same difference as between 40 and 50. Ratio are interval variables, but there's no absolute zero. So, for example, height, I mean, how tall you are, you as soon as you have height, you have a number. So you can't have height without a number. There's no absolute zero there. Weights is the same. You may ask, well, why do we care about that? That sounds very complicated. Why do we care about that? Well, that really matters because depending on how we measure our variables and our data, we can then compute different numbers from that. So here we've got proportions, the mode, the middle number, Frequency distribution, median, percentiles, quartiles, mean, standard deviation, standard error of mean, ratio, coefficient, or variation. These are different types of things that you can compute from your data. And depending on the type of data that you've got, you can or cannot compute these different characteristics. And so I've given you the summary table there. Um, if you have nominal data um, where one is not equal to the other, or ordinal data, one is greater than the other, or interval, something is 20, 30, is plus 10. But I've also summarized here what you can and cannot do with those types of variables. And so earlier I was talking about Lippert scale data, agree, neutral, and disagree. And this is usually on a questionnaire, right? Do you agree? How, you know, how much do you agree? Strongly agree, strongly disagree. From a purist perspective, that's ordinal data. But in a lot of research studies, that is treated as an interval uh, variable because, you, as you can see, you can do a lot more with that variable. So ordinal data, you can't find the mean standard deviation or standard error of the mean. You can't find that from this type of data. So researchers have been very smart and treated it as interval, and therefore that expands their power of computation. They can compute more things, basically. So the levels of measurement affect how we can describe our data and what sorts of inferential statistical tests we can use. And that's really important. Once you've actually got your data, um, you'll see that. All right, I tried to just give you a very basic overview of quantitative data um, and what it all means. Thanks so much, and I shall see you next week.